All right, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is LP or Lauren, whichever you prefer. Uh, and I am the owner and co-founder of Focus on Health, joined by Miss Lynette Marrero and Speedrack. Um, we've joined together for uh, the second time to bring you Sp Speed Rack Academy, which are sessions led by former Speed Rack competitors um, that align with the theme or the overall theme for the month. They're carefully uh, curated by these individuals and they really just spend time discussing topics that really resonate with them, which is one of the things that I love because every topic and every class is very different. I see a lot of familiar faces and uh, uh, most of you came to uh, Andrea's class. Um, so it's really lovely to see you all again. And today I'm really excited to introduce you all to Mary Palak, who, uh, who is coming from California. Uh, she will be discussing this week's theme, pull up a chair, uh, creating equitable spaces. Uh, so without further ado, here is uh, Mary. Hi, y'all. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Mary Palak. I am coming to you from San Jose, sunny San Jose, California. It was raining like 30 seconds ago. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a speed rack alum from season five through season seven. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here and to talk about this kind of talk. I don't want to like preface this by saying I am in zero percent claiming to be an expert in creating equitable spaces. I don't think any, I mean, if we had more experts, maybe it would be easier to do this. Uh, but I wanted to share a lot of the things that I've learned that have helped me personally and that I have found powerful and that I believe could um, help lead to actual change and actual equity. So right on. Uh, Lauren, are you sharing the slideshow? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, tech struggle. Pardon me for a <laughs> moment. <laughs> I was like, but I have a really cute slide of me as a baby. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just start. All right. There we are. Awesome. Um, so that's me. Um, um, a little bit of, if you can click, click ahead and click on the next slide. Um, a little bit about me, I am an immigrant. I was born in the Philippines. Um, my family moved to America during what was known as the Yellow Revolution or the People's Power Revolution in the 80s, um, which replaced a uh, militant dictator by the name of Ferdinand Marcos and put in place the first female president of the country. Um, I've spent pretty much all of my life since then in California in the Bay Area. And I've been working in hospitality for over 20 years. Um, as I mentioned, I am a uh, alumna of the Speed Rack uh, competition from seasons five, six, and seven. And I was so lucky to have uh, taken the California title and been a national finalist in season seven. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how that experience has really kind of pushed me to where I'm at. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, so the, the kind of theme of this talk is the power of solidarity, and we're gonna I'm, we're gonna talk a little bit about some historical like aspects of it. But this quote from Grace Lee Boggs, who is um, an amazing Asian American activist and all around like feminist and activist, um, the only way to survive is by taking care of one another. And I think like this past year has really made this kind of like, it, it's shown the truth of this, um, especially in our hospitality industry. Um, but um, right now we're, it's an interesting time because we just had Black History Month. This is Women's History Month. May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. And then we have Pride. And I think, being at the crossroads of all these things, it's, I find that it's really, or I, I, I sense that it's really easy for us to celebrate um, each other. And we might even find it really easy to sympathize with one another when, when we hear about another's struggles. 
Uh, but what's not so easy to do is how we empathize or really own each other's problems as our own. And that's a practice. And that's something that I, that's what I'm aiming to share today is the practice of, of acknowledging that. And um, we can go to the next slide. So how do we find solidarity? We start by exploring our shared history. Like when we're talking about all these history months, like Black History Month, Women's History Month, uh, AAPI Heritage Month, the thing that is most helpful I find is that we recognize that it is human history all the time, right? Um, and that all of the struggles from the past, they have still continued to affect all of us today. Um, we also need to recognize the good things that we bring, the way that we add to the conversations, but also the mistakes we make and own up to them. I, I, I've, we, I've talked about this uh, kind of account of uh, being accountable for your own actions a lot. And um, we just talked about that during uh, the Mindfulness Matters in January. Uh, I wrote a piece about the harm that we can cause. So really owning up to that. Um, it, it gives, it clears a path forward. And then, but in the end, we recognize that it's all of our problem. But I've decided before we get into anything heavy, we'll start with a cocktail. And as I mentioned, um, you can go to the next slide, this is a recipe. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I immigrated to the US in the 80s. And it was right around that time that the Philippines got its first female president, her name was Cora Aquino. Um, she was, you know, no one really thought much of her. She was like a, they thought she was just a house mom um, who wasn't much of a threat. And she ended up, you know, uh, helping to overthrow, leading a revolution that helped overthrow a military, militant dictator. Um, so the Queen Cora Sun Sizzle is, I was originally a rum cocktail that I had made, um, but I'm gonna use some seed lips. So, it is built in the same kind of fashion as like a Queen's Park swizzle, um, but I'm using a, a calamansi, which if I have, uh, I know I, I saw a on here, but any other Filipino attendees, you all know what calamansi <laughs> is. Um, so I have some fresh mint in here and we add a little bit of lime juice. Me just checking my recipe, half ounce of lime juice. And I'm just gonna press that to get some of those oils out. And to that, I'm going to add an ounce of a calamansi syrup. And I just do, do a really basic syrup of calamansi puree to sugar, equal parts by uh, weight. And calamansi uh, puree, you can typically find in like the frozen section at, um, some Asian markets, sometimes it's um, like you can order it through your, whoever your food supplier is if you're ordering it for an account. But the calamansi is essentially a, a hybrid between kumquat and lime. So it's like a, like a sweeter, slightly bitter lime. Um, and we literally we put it on everything in Filipino cuisine. And because of that like touch of bitterness, I am putting a, a little bit of saline solution in there to kind of um, temper the bitterness. And then, um, so we're starting off with something NA, kind of working our way up. Uh, we're using this seed lip spice. And I chose the spice, even though this is like a citrusy cocktail and an herbal cocktail, where I could have used maybe like seed lip garden or uh, grove, I chose the spice because I really wanted to replicate that kind of like rummy warmness um that you get awesome i make sure i have all my ingredients y'all i didn't want to mess it up i have some crushed ice it's a swizzle mary did you crush your ice or you have crushed ice oh i wish i had a scott no i pre-crushed it i was oh so i was like, you so know, having like i know you have all that equipment in your house i wasn't sure <laughs> Maybe I had an ice crusher. No, I used a good old like hammer, <laughs> hammer and loose bag. Uh, give that a little swizzle. And yeah, I think that because um, calamansi particularly is often used. I mean, we use it for as a, like a drink, but 
more often than not, it's used in savory applications. Like we squeeze it over everything that we eat. So having the spice there to add kind of those like warm notes to it, uh, it's Kalamansi loves that. I'm just making the biggest mess. And I'm gonna top it off with a fresh mint sprig. That's the Corazon Swizzle, Queen Corazon Swizzle. Um, if you wanted to make an alcoholic version of it, dark rum is great for it. So now that we have a drink to start with, I'm sorry, I'm cleaning up because this is gonna bother me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so much ice on my deck. <laughs> All right, let's dive into um, kind of early beginnings. And um, we're, I don't want this to be a history lesson um, because why, but you do, you need that context of history. And um, particularly I find for, um, you, you know, you, you're some, most people are somewhat familiar with like a lot of uh, general Asian American history, but Filipino American history is not often talked about. So, and they, they contribute quite a bit to not just like uh, hospitality in the US, but global hospitality in general. Um, I'm also going to talk about two other industries that are kind of like hospitality industry adjacent, um, but I do think that they're super important to talk about. So we can go to the next slide. Awesome. So um, the Philippines, Philippines in America, I mean, they date back, uh, I, the earliest was like in the 1500s, 1700s, I think. But um, really when you start seeing um, the Philippine, Filipino people talked about in America, um, right around like after the uh, Spanish-American War, uh, a tribe called the Igoro people from the Northern Islands of the Philippines was brought to the US as a, as a display for the, world, the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. So they basically built them like a fake habitat and paraded them around essentially like a little sideshow. And it was like, watch, look, take a glimpse at the exoticism and how like the savage people live. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's, this is gonna be really important when we talk about US imperialism and how we were viewed to Americans. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And there, I mean, violence, I mean, anti-Asian American, anti-Asian kind of uh, sentiments are not a new thing. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first and only law to ever have been implemented to prevent members of just one specific ethnic group from immigrating to the US. And a lot of these laws were put in place basically to protect the whiteness of the United States uh, because immigrants were coming, Asian immigrants were coming over in such high numbers that there was a fear that they, the, the homogenousness of the US, AKA the whiteness of the US was in danger. Um, this was quickly followed in 1924 by the Asian Exclusion Act or Immigration Act that banned all immigration from Asia. Um, and that was, you know, that was in effect for over 40 years. Um, we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, right around the uh, Spanish-American War, um, even though the, U the Philippines had already declared its independence from Spain, once the US uh, won the Spanish-American War, it basically took claim over Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and around the same time, Hawaii becomes like an official territory of the, the US as well. And if you, these, these images are from a book called uh, The Forbidden Book, um, which is a, the story of the Filipino American war, but in political cartoons. And these were all published in actual like newspapers and magazines at the time. And 
you can see from like the depictions how we were viewed. We were viewed as the little brown brothers. That we were infant. I can't say that word. Infantilized. Infant like we were made. Like you know, they thought of us as helpless. And you know, they there's. I think there's an image, and it's called the white man's burden. And in the image, there's um, uh, Uncle Sam is holding baskets of people from Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, um, and they're lugging them up this mountain to civilization. So uh, this, this idea um, actually ends up permeating through the colonies too, um, which we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, but what, what ends up happening is because of this, because the Philippines during this time is an American territory, then Filipinos become American nationals and they're actually able to come to the US. So we can go to the next slide. And this brings about what we call the Manong generation. I had to put the slide up here of all like my titos looking all fly and stuff in the twenties, um, look at all boss. Cause it was really cool that like, like their style was, was really cool. But what, what ended up happening was they were all young um, essentially young workers, laborers, or farm workers, um, but there were also a lot of anti-miscegenation laws, so they couldn't, they couldn't marry anybody once they got to America, and there's a whole generation that was essentially lost, whole generation of Filipino-American immigrants that were lost because they were not given any means to start a family. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, they were original farm workers. My, my grandpa and my dad both worked, I grew up in a very agricultural city called Watsonville. Um, they were the farm laborers. My dad cut lettuce when he first came to America. Um, and like I said, yeah, no women came to the U.S. at that time because um, the men were basically leaving the Philippines to come seek work. Um, and to kind of uh, to kind of like deal with that, what ended up happening in like the 30s and the 40s was the formation of Filipino social clubs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Sorry, I'm following along too, guys. I just make sure. So Filipino social clubs. Um, you know, I actually grew up in a lot of Filipino social clubs. They're still around. Um, but what originally what they served as back then, obviously they were a way to gather, have entertainment, um, find some commonality. And this was like an early, right? This is like solidarity within a group, within, a, within your own immediate community. Um, it was also a little bit like for protection, but again, they didn't have any women. So what they would do is they would invite like, you know, local women, so they'd be white women, you know, that would come to these dances um, and these social clubs. And if you consider how women were viewed essentially as uh, property in those times, um, you can imagine um, that this did not make white men particularly happy. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in Watsonville, we could go to the next slide, um, where a very famous riot uh, happened in the 1930s um, um, where Filipinos were murdered um, because they danced with a white lady. And I, I like, if these kind of stories sound familiar, um, that's the point. <laughs> the, the, the point is if these stories sound familiar, but you've never heard of it in this context in the, the you know, Filipino history context, that's kind of the point. There's, there was, this, there's, there's a lot of this, right? In those times between the thirties and the sixties where it is um, limiting, it's, it's, it's about rules about limiting the mixture of the brown people and the white people. Yeah, um, those, but as those social clubs developed, like I said, I mentioned, I grew up in them and they're, you know, they're, they serve now as community centers. Um, they, pro they provide scholarships, um, they provide some cultural like uh, connections still for young people, especially those who are children of immigrants and um, 
they don't necessarily have that connection with, with their homeland. Um, so I found them always really valuable. And I didn't know for the longest time that they got their start as this to protect one another. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and then in the 40s, obviously we, we know that World War II and that we're like at peak anti-Asian kind of feeling um, executive order 9066. We just celebrated, I think the 79th anniversary of this happening. Um, and it was, you know, if you consider how many of those people that got put into these camps were actually just American citizens, many of them went off to serve and fight for the U.S. in the war anyway. Um, it, it was, I would say one of, you know, like the probably the lowest point um, for, for Asian Americans. We can go to the next slide. Um, in the 60s, we get the civil rights movement. Um, and obviously the civil rights movement, and the reason I mentioned this, obviously this was largely the work of the black community, right? Largely the work of the black community. Um, but the Asian American community directly benefited it from it because it, in addition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, it lifted the ban on Asian immigrants and then you got this wave of people coming over again. Um, and again, there was the continue to occupy those, those same roles, farm workers, service. Um, and I, the reason I, I really wanna talk about farm worker, there's, there's two industries that we're I'm gonna touch on in this is farm and agriculture and also uh, nurses. And the reasons I feel like these are really important, even though they might not like be exactly the industry that we like live in and work in, um, given the past year, we've all been grouped into this just cluster called essential workers. And I think it's really important to recognize the, the history of those industries as well, because they still affect us. So um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and the, the 60s was all about like organizing and um, building community. And I know that many people, many people have heard of Cesar Chavez, of course, he has a whole holiday devoted to him and many people have also heard of Dolores Huerta and very few have heard of Larry Itlong. And Larry Itlong um, was actually, he was uh, the leader of the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee. And they were the committee that actually started the Delano grape strike. And it wasn't until after they started the strikes that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta who were the head of the National Farm Workers Association joined them in solidarity. So we see this, this uh, they ended up combining together to become the United Farm Workers. And this strike went on for five years and resulted in improved conditions for over like 10,000 farmers. Um, and you know, this is one of like those first showings of real solidarity between two different communities. Even though, and if you and if you want to think, if you want to get real like historical with it, it makes sense that these communities. I mean, there's I grew up like I said, I grew up in Watsonville, and it's a predominantly Mexican um, area, and I've always felt a very like a, a I don't know a natural closeness with like Chicano culture, and it's also because we have a shared colonized history too, that Spain basically claimed us both for hundreds of years. Um, Again, and then this, we can see the solid, solidarity on another level if we go to the next slide. Uh, during that strike, um, the Black Panthers took it to another level by boycotting the grocery stores that carried that produce. And that's where we saw real like, you know, it spread the like efficacy of this. So you now have um, like the, the like Mexican farm laborers, you have the Filipino farm laborers, and now you have the Black Panthers working together to really affect some change. And that's just so powerful. Like when all of them started to own each other's issues and when they started to like really stand in solidarity, like look how, how like that was when like the changes happened. 
right? So I think that that's like a, such a amazing example of um, how powerful solidarity can be, how effective it can be when we own each other's problems, when we own them and say, that's my problem too. So I think that that's like a moment in the history that doesn't get talked about a lot, um, but I, I love it. And, I, and again, this is something, this is, even though it might not be like hospitality on the nose, um, this is very much tied to our industry. Um, and then another industry that's tied to our industry, we can talk about in the next slide, or rather adjacent to um, our, you know, Filipino nurses. I don't know who out there who's watching this who doesn't know a Filipino nurse. I bet you do. I bet you have an auntie or a tita or something because my mom was a nurse, my sister was a nurse, is a nurse. Uh, I did not, I could not stand the sight of blood, so I became a bartender. Um, but the 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 whole culture of Filipino nurses that dates back to that that period of U.S. imperialism, because in addition to um, like uh, basically treat like infantilizing, you know, the Filipino people, they brought education, like American style, Western style education to the Philippines, as well as medical practices. And uh, this is like an early like uh, university, um, nursing university in the Philippines. And post-World War II, when there was a need, like a, a what's the word I'm thinking of? a shortage of American nurses, uh, they, you know, they campaigned heavily to bring Filipino nurses because they were already familiar with Western practices over. And uh, that's where that culture of Filipino nurses and that culture of care for, for most Filipino women, nowadays it's Filipino women and men, um, that's where that comes from. Um, so yeah, um, we can take another little cocktail break, I think, after this, because that was a lot of info. Oh no, oh no, that's, that's, sorry, I forgot this important part. This is like really important today, and this is why this is really why I, I wanted to touch about uh, Filipino workers. There was an article that came out recently that talked about like one of the most dangerous professions in uh, during COVID was like uh, the was in the hospitality industry. It was cooks. It was like line cooks. Um, and then the, 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 the next tier after that are nurses. And these are all from um, an account that I, I, I owe a lot of like um, education, like my learning from is AAPI Women Lead. I got to attend a really amazing um, conference from them a couple years ago. But yeah, they, the Filipino nurses were brought over from the 60s, 70s, 80s. They were brought around to fill the void after World War II. They stayed around to battle the AIDS crisis. And when, you know, when nobody wanted to touch AIDS patients back then, and they're still alive to work um, to fight the COVID crisis. I, I, I have heard so many stories of nurses who came out of retirement and nurses and doctors who came out of retirement to help battle uh, the current pandemic, um, but they're, you know, and because of that, because many of them are older who are still working, they're dying at a, like a disproportionate um, uh, level. So whereas like Filipino nurses only make up about 5% of the like whole nursing workforce, they're dying at around 30%, which is like, to me, just a, a shocking, um, like a shocking number, but it's also like, I understand where that comes from. And that's my mom's nursing class from the 80s. Um, let's take a cocktail break because uh, it feels good to have some comfort after talking a little bit about some heads. I don't know if there's any questions because I can't read the chat, but were there any questions so far? No, just conversation. Just, hey, so. you're awesome. Hi. <laughs> <Another> awesome. <laughs> and how beautifully colorful your drinks are. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, this is a, so this is like peak comfort level cocktail right here. Um, ube, like, like calamansi is a very common drink or common ingredient in uh, Filipino cuisine. Um, it's typically used in dessert applications. I just had an ube cheesecake 
um, yesterday. It was delightful. So, um, but I'm making for this a vegan version of, of Ramos Jim Fizz, essentially. Um, it's music and, this like, I think, <laughs> and this is actually a lot easier. I don't know. To me, it felt like a lot easier. I don't know what it is. I think maybe it's like the fat content of the, the coconut milk. Um, it's a little bit easier to bring together than a gin fizz. Um, so I'm going to start with some aquafaba. I have it pre-measured. It's an ounce of aquafaba. That is, of course, chickpea juice. You can either get it from the can or you can soak chickpeas overnight. Um, so I have an ounce of that. And then I have, um, and I had a little bit of lemon juice in there as well. What did I say? Yeah, no. <laughs> Checking my measurements. Add some lemon juice. And then I'm putting um, two teaspoons of sugar. I'm just using my bar spoon. Um, if you have simple syrup, you could sub out for like half ounce of simple syrup. You just don't want to put too much sugar because we're also putting a little bit of the ube jam in there and that has that's that has some sweetness to it too. Oh no, I'm not stressed. Oh no. Ube Halaya is a um, an ube jam. It's essentially like pure and ube. I didn't really talk about what what ube actually is. It's actually a it's a it's a potato, like a a root. Oh, well, they call it a root vegetable, but is it pretty, basically so it's starchy. It's starchy. Um, so I only put like a little bit of the I put like two bar spoons full of the jam in there too. But I mean. The starchy kind of acts like similarly to pectin in berry jams. So I don't I don't find them texturally that different. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and I also just eat that on like toast. So it's delightful. Um, and then I'm gonna put um, just a drop of, oh, I just realized that this ube extract did not come in a dropper. It's like straight pour. So I'm gonna gauge a drop or two in there. That's going to give it that really purpley color. So my my best friend when I was growing up was uh, Filipino mm -hmm. and she, her mom always made me call her. Her mother always made me call her Tita. <laughs> and, oh yeah. But she used to give us ube. I think it was like ube with cheese or something like that. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we put cheese in a lot of desserts. Yep, that's a, and you know what that is. I don't know if you, that sounds familiar to you. If you're of a Cuban descent, you know cheese and desserts. That is, uh, you know, remnants of Spanish kind of influences. I love but yeah, that. Yeah, there is. There's like there's some, lots of baked goods. That's it's a sweet like brioche dough, and we'll put like cheese on it. Um, uh, the but the tita thing we also the it is really important like there is a very high reverence that we put on gener like our generational elders so you would call yeah like your tita is like what I make my niece and nephews call me because it kind of means <laughs> like young fat it's like young aunt well I her mom like, was like as opposed to like, like auntie not, yeah her mom is like I'm not old you're calling me tita I was like yeah, okay <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> Like Tita is like younger, Auntie is a little bit old. Like my 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 two sisters are both older, but their kids call me Tita, but they call my other sisters Auntie. So it, there's a difference <laughs> between Tita and Auntie. But there's also other terms of like we have lots of terms of endearment. If you're the same generation, um, like it's your brother, your sister, your cousin, or something, it's Kuya or Ate. And if it's like a, maybe like a, a slightly older, like your parents' generation, maybe manong or manang, that's what manong means. It's a, it's a term of reverence uh, and respect. Uh, and then we have like lolo and lola for grandparents. Um, I have some full fat uh, Thai coconut milk. You can use whatever um, coconut milk, but it should be full fat. That's really important. That was, I pre-measured that because I knew it was gonna be thick. <laughs> um, and then I'm using some good old Tanqueray London Dry Gin. And I do a reverse shake for um, my Ramoses because I find it's faster. It sets the foam faster. Um, but I'm also a believer and there's no wrong way to make a drink. So however way you believe is right for your, you know, in your heart and soul, do that. But I do a reverse way. Yeah. 
I literally almost fell over standing there. So this is <laughs> doing great. <laughs> I like tip this way for no reason. All right, I'm gonna strain out the ice. You can, you can kind of see the color a little bit as I pour it out. It's actually really beautiful. And then shake it again with ice, without ice. It's splashing on me, so I was trying to like not make a mess. And then I like to pour it over uh, the soda water. I'm using the fizziest soda water on earth, of course, my beloved Topo Chico. Because that's going to see how it, it foams up so much like quicker that way. The color is gorgeous. All right. This, I don't know, this color thing makes me think of unicorns. And just like <laughs> happiness. Make a little bit more, see if I can get a little lift. That's like my dream little drink lift. right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little lift yes, please. Y'all, it's been a minute since I've bartended for real, for real. So this is a, this is good. Yeah. Good stuff. I'm garnishing it with a little bit of nutmeg. Um because that, 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 again, like that warm spice, that warm spice I feel is like very prevalent in like tropic areas and the Philippines is a tropic area, so. Ivy, you're, you're, a, big Ramos, you're a big Ramos person. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Anything, anything creamy girl, like I am, I'm pretty. <laughs> Me and Pam Wiz love ourselves some creamy <laughs> drinks. <laughs> I do too, dude. Like I'm allergic to pineapple, but I lo I will drink a pina colada. I don't care. I don't oh, care. So good. I'm like <laughs> we're we're getting into springtime. I'm like, oh, we're leaving flip season. Oh, sad. <laughs> that looks really good. I'm gonna have to make that. This Thank you for really Asian Michael. <laughs> I know this is. This is great. Yeah, the ube jam you can find um, if there's a Filipino section in your, um, you can sometimes find the pure like frozen ube like um, um, like the flesh frozen sometimes and you can make your own puree out of that. Yeah, it's delightful. <laughs> All right, since we went kind of a tropical way, let's talk a little, little bit about uh, tiki, just for a minute. Um, this is a pic, an image of uh, Don the Beachcomber's original bartenders, and they all look kind of the same. Um, there was an article really recently um, that described the hidden Filipinos behind tiki. And I think that I'm not alone that I I like most of the like Filipino Americans I know that, that that especially the ones in hospitality that heard about that had really mixed feelings about that because they were basically used for their looks right they were used because they helped sell that escapism they helped sell that feeling of being an island because we look like island people we were we are island people um, and it's I mean, the, the mixed feeling was there was part of me that was like really disappointed that that's how, you know, my, my, my ancestors were used as basically, you know, to help sell the gimmick. But the other side of it is that like tinge of pride. And that is like, because, because Filipinos get like kind of grouped in with like Asia as a group. They also get kind of grouped in with the Pacific Islanders as a group. We search for any kind of representation that we can like grasp on, right? Anywhere where there might be something that looks even remotely like me or my family or someone I know 
where we're, we gravitate to, we're like we, we have that tinge of pride in it. It's like, finally, I see myself out there in popular culture. And there is no better example than that for me than the Hula Girl, which is the next slide. Um, the Hula Girl, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love boobies. That's why this is so like, I love Speed Rack. Speed Rack loves boobies. Like, but this representation, um, and I, you're gonna see now that you know, now that you bring light to it, anytime you go to a tropical or a tiki bar, you're gonna see, you're gonna find a, like a, a booby picture of a, a beautiful Polynesian looking girl. And, you know, when I was younger, I was, I've talked to some of my like, other friends about this, and we, we all did the same thing. When we were younger, we totally owned that hula girl vibe, right? Uh, you know, I had like the cute little hula girl stickers on my car. Um, and, you know, it was like, ooh, about being like sexy and cute and like um, flirty and fun. But really, when you think about it now, when you think, when you see the context of this, you see that, you know, Trader Vic, you know, the white man lounging and being served by the half naked brown lady, you know, it's this sexualization. And it's also this like, making um our women servile like giving the image that that's what we are we're like you know what that your image of of tiki your image of escapism includes the service of a young topless girl and you know it it's it's tough because that kind of mentality really leads to this fetishes like this I can't say, fetishizing um, of women, and particularly of Asian women, of uh, Polynesian women, of Filipino women, of women who even could remotely um, resemble that. Um, I, the next slide is a, is a TikTok that I've, I've, I've uh, shared. I don't know if it'll play, um, but it's, it makes me laugh every single time. Um, uh, I hear it. Let's see if it plays. But every like Filipino girl I know has probably had this happen to them once. Does it play with sound? Oh, it's not. <laughs> That's to make you log in. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> the link's on the slide, but basically it's. Um... I want to know. Can we pop the link in the chat? <laughs> Yeah, you guys, can, it's so, it's so funny, dude. It's like, it, it's so funny, but it's also like, I got this like gut reaction to that, to that uh, video. And it's basically, you know, a Filipino girl and it's some white man comes up to her and goes, are you Filipina? You know, my wife's Filipina, Mabuhai, you're Maganda. Like, and starts talking to her and try to like, kind of flirt with her just cause she's Filipino. And he happens to have a Filipino wife. And um, it's, uh, to me, that reaction, like that, that gut check reaction I had to that is, uh, are, you, are you gonna play it? Cause it's so, <laughs> it's, I, the music is what got me. It hit me and I was like, yep, that's exactly how I feel about this every single time. Okay, that's fine. Pop it in the chat if you will. I'll pop it in the chat the link. Um, but it's it's worth a look because the the girl's reaction is this like mix of exhaustion and frustration, and but it brings up a really good point of and, and I know that I know at some point um, a lot of women this happens to is you get the what are you question, and the what are you question to me is one of the most like, I don't know, it feels like the most dehumanizing question to ask someone, like you can, you can even phrase it in a different way and you understand the meaning and you, and you know, but when someone says, what are you? It's just, you know, and it, for the longest time I had honestly no idea 
how to deal with that question. Um, and for the longest time, and I'm talking like the majority of my career behind the bar, I had no way of, uh, is it playing on the, if it plays on the player? Cause there's, it's embedded on that slide. I don't know if it'll play on the player. No, it's fine. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I, I had no idea how to address that question with grace. Because when we're behind the bar, we have to deal with things with grace, with this like patience of a saint that the people we're serving don't deserve. But we have to, right? Because that's, that's the nature of our service, right? And we're all also the, 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 the culture of tipping, you know? Uh, that we have to like kind of sacrifice little bits of ourselves to make sure that the person sitting in front of us is happy. And we talk a lot about being like hospitable and creating the experience. And we, well, most of us do what we do because we do love to do that. We do love to create these experiences. We do love to make people happy and we love to serve, but that should never ever come at any cost of any part of you. And that took a long time for me to really grasp and like hang on to and it still does and because that's it's it's a practice I always like like to talk about like the first time you ever had to cut someone off and uh, compared to like now how how easy it is for you to finesse your way into that situation and it's it is a practice like that but it should and it's so much it's much more of a personal practice um that you should devote you know some some time to to find and I know that like uh, LP and I were on a seminar of tales and she talked a lot about language and really that's it. It's finding those words and then saying that over and over again until you're comfortable and you know exactly how to turn that situation from one where you would just bottle it up and run like what I would do um, to something where you can either take that and you know approach it, address it and be like, hey, that's not a cool question to ask or even better, take that as a teaching moment for them, you know? Um, and like I have found more often than not, when I, when I address that, those, that question head on, you know, with a, just like something smarter, you know, like, you know, why do you need to know? Even if you ask, so why do you need to know? Why is that important to you? And it, it immediately starts, you know, kind of, and that's, that's an easy way to say, to, to ask that back, without being combative or confrontational. It's a genuine question. Why, do you, what, why is that of interest to you? Um, and that, that changes the tone of the conversation, right? But um, that's something that I'm like, you know, in our industry, I really, really love to stress is that you absolutely have that right. And you're not alone and you, it, it takes a lot of time and practice like to feel like you <laughs> to feel comfortable. I still don't, honestly, <laughs> but it, it's so much worth it. It's so much more worth it because I come out of that not feeling like a little bit less whole. I come out feeling like, well, I, at least I, you know, I defended me. So if they didn't get it, they didn't get it. And we can move on from it as opposed to just keeping it locked in because that's not healthy. Um, I think the next slide is actually going to talk a little bit like, I think that is this, yeah, there it is. So this, this, so like I mentioned, I didn't know how to address any of this stuff, um, but I was real fucking lucky. Oh, sorry, I'm not sorry, <laughs> but I was real lucky because uh, early on, and it's so funny because this is so recent for me. Um, I didn't discover speed rack until like maybe like what, five years ago? I didn't compete until maybe four years ago now. No, longer than that, maybe longer than that. Um, like six years ago. Um, but, you know, before that, and I don't know if, if many of you all feel this way too, before that you try, I tried to assimilate by being one of the guys. I try to assimilate by like hiding, not hiding my femininity, but hiding like my womanness, like the, the you know, I didn't want to like call attention to it. You know, I could fit in in this industry just as well as any bro in suspenders back then. And it it wasn't until um, that I got involved with Speed Rack and that I found 
real sisterhood in this competition that I, you know, started to feel comfortable in that, started to feel comfortable in saying like, yeah, I'm a feminist. You know, I like, I, like seven years ago, I wouldn't have said that. Um, but when I found solidarity with these women and not just these women, but like years and years of years of women coming through this competition, it gave me, it gave me power. It gave me strength. And that's where I still draw on from today. So that's, that's one of the kind of another example, kind of a direct example for me where I found this solidarity and that gave me power. Um, and it still does today. So is there any, I can't read the chat, any questions? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna presume no questions. No questions, just comments, yeah. you know. Uh, people people can relate. Um. Yeah, and it's like, um, you know, what's really special about this competition is I guess it's a competition, yes, it's fierce and it's fierce, but we help each other. And that's so not, you know, that's not as common, I think in a lot of competitions that you get that kind of help. Like my first year I did this, I had no clue. I was the only girl from San Jose in a sea of like really amazing talented San Francisco bartenders in San Francisco. And you was kicked the so much city. ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it was like, you know, and it was, it was crazy because, but, but I owe that. A lot of it was one, I had had some like friends who had done it. I reached out from across the country, but they, I could, they couldn't train with me back then. Um, but two, the day before the competition, there was this dinner and uh, one of the girls, Candace, she was working at, um, what, low, what is it? One where Techo is, I can't remember the name of the bar. I'm so bad right now. <laughs> But she opened up her bar to for any of the girls that wanted to warm up the next day. And I like this was the first time I had seen any other competitors even do it. And they let like me seeing them was just like, oh my gosh, I'm learning so much in this like 30 seconds where I'm watching these really fierce ladies who have been doing this for a few years. Um, you know, I'm picking up so much just from this one interaction. And that was something that I've, you know, I've tried really tried to pay forward. If you've ever gotten the link to my speed rack videos <laughs> over the years that I originally, I think I originally made them for Jesse Weinstein out in, uh, uh, in DC. If you've ever gotten links to those videos, that's still, that training is still so, it still works for this today. One day when this competition's back, I'd love to host another like virtual training of that, but um, yes, yeah, we'll sign yeah. you up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is like a really important moment for me. I think that like where that solidarity um, continues to impact me. I still, you know, I just saw Alicia Walton, who's in the who won this season, or maybe this the season before. I saw her the other day. Um, that kind of brings me to the current. We can we can go to the next slide. Um, kind of bringing these to this current climate about um, violence against Asian Americans today. And I think what's really, you know, I mentioned how we have these like terms of endearment for our, for generational, because we like to show respect. There is a, like the, the reverence, and I, I know this is true of most cultures, but the, the reverence that we particularly hold for our elders and the fact that they're the ones being targeted right now is so, so traumatic and it's so tough. Um, but it's, it, it, it's not anything new as we've seen as we went through that mini history lesson, it's not really anything new. But um, right now is one of those moments where you can look at this and say, oh, that's too bad for them. Or you can look at this and say, what can I do? And that's where I'm trying to kind of bring this, bring this on home to, right? Is that like, what's happening today, like what's happening to the, the, the anger and the grief that I feel when I see this is the same anger 
and I and grief that I felt a year ago when we were learning about Ahmaud Aubrey, when we were learning about Breonna Taylor. It comes from the same place of ignorance and hate. So it's not like just how I saw those those problems as my problem, this is my problem. That's that's how I've begun to see the world. And it's it's a lot less, it's a it's a lot scarier too, because you're, you know, you you feel that pain from other people, but it's a lot less lonely too, because you know you're not alone. Um and then in the next, and this particularly in the, we could see this in the Bay Area because um, you can go to the next slide and this is kind of, I want to end more on a positive note. Um, we see the, that black communities have been, you know, really showing up for Asian communities. Um, there've been a lot of uh, like protecting the elderly walks where people volunteer to walk uh, the el elderly Asians. And, you know, it's, it, that's the kind of, strength that I see that that it it it's almost like a reflection of that those uh the 60s when it was the Filipinos the Mexicans the black people black panthers all working together to make some change so seeing this today is also really powerful and um it's what's going to end up driving us forward and how we're going to move forward I'm going back to uh what what uh, Grace Lee Boggs said the only way we're going to move forward is if we take care of each other and this is it. This is us taking care of each other. So maybe it's less of a like this is my problem too, but more more of like how can I help take care of you? And that's that's the at the heart of hospitality, right? How can I take care of you? Because when I take care of you, that means I'm take care, taking care of me too. Um, and that's all I know. I think we're, we're at four o'clock and I didn't want to go too so, so, so long. Um, but we'll end with a cocktail. Um, a boozy, because I feel like we've, we've talked some things out and we're going to talk a little, go a little more spirit forward. Um, if anyone has comments or questions, just, you know, throw them at me while I'm making it. Y'all know how to make things. <laughs> you know, I hear you talk a lot about how the community has been so good to you, but you've also been so great to this community. And, you know, it's funny when Howdy. we talked about this session, one of the things that really resonated with me was all the stuff you did for the ladies in your community to get prepared for speed rack, right? And then, you yeah, know- and like, Yeah, and that, that's, that was really important. And I think that's really important to bring up because like, honestly, every time, I mean, I'm, I'll be real honest when I started like participating and networking and getting more involved in this industry. Obviously it was for my own personal gain, you know, for my own personal education. But the point, the tipping point for me was when I started to reach outward and when I started to include other people with me to do those things, that's where I found the most success. That year, that first year where I got to train girls in San Jose was the year I won. And it was because I had this like extra confidence boost of having like, you know, seeing these girls who are doing it the first time and feeling their nerves and being like, oh, I'm the old dog now. <laughs> and so it was like, you know, it gave me this, this, this confidence to do really well in the competition. And you helped so many long way. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep wanting, like, if I, if that was like, I mean, that's the thing I think I love the most is training for speed rec. And I love doing it like I will if you're in California I'll likely just drive to you um and and I'll try I'll physically train you if you're not in California I'll I'll FaceTime and do a zoom class with you and I love that it's like it it's it it gives me like a a, a natural high um so I just have some chinar and some sherry in here if you get anyone's paying actually attention to this cocktail demo of course we are um, and then I'm putting a little all spice around. This drink is, uh, again, playing off those warm spices of the, but this one's more hitting more towards like the Caribbean. Um, I have a little all spice dram in there as well. I think I already put salt in it, but I'm, I'll put it in it. And I have some Ronzacapa, delightful guatemala man. I have a question for you, Mary. Uh, so someone asked, 
Do you have examples of ways to respond when guests ask, what are you? Yeah. Um, well, my, my first reaction is to, to bring it back to the answer with a question. I'll almost always like, why are you curious? I won't do it be like, why do you want to know? Because that's like, you know, the whole finesse of, of being a bartender, right? And I'll ask why, like, oh, you know, why, why are you curious? Or, you know, why is, how is that pertinent to what we're doing? And sometimes they're genuinely curious because, you know, they want it, they're most, more often than not. Right. They want to be like, oh, my, one of my friends is Filipina, you know, that, that equivalency for some reason. Um, but when you to ask that question back, it automatically gives you a little bit of power. And then you can steer that conversation the way you want it to go. If they're actually genuinely curious about your heritage, you know, then you can be like, yeah, talk about the things that are like make you proud of who you are, proud of where you're from. And that becomes that teaching moment for them. But it steers it away from them, from it being like, because um, I've had people ask me, like, what kind of Asian are you? Um, and then like follow it up and it's like, oh yeah, you know, as long as you're not so-and-so kind of Asian because they're the crazy ones. And I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> and it, you know, you steer it away from being, you take that power from being, um, from allowing someone to fetishize you and um, make it so that you're, you take control of the conversation. The point of that is just take control of the conversation and steer it in the way that you would rather have it as opposed to feeling scared by it because you don't want what the worst case scenario is, someone who's gonna be creepy or someone who's gonna say something inappropriate to you. Yeah. So that, that takes so much practice, honestly. I agree. Dude, this cocktail looks so good. It's delightful. I, I, I've, I've made this cocktail many times um, and it's delightful every time. <laughs> and I'm garnishing again with that, that spice, that warm nutmeg. Is there a specific sherry, that, a, a specific Oloroso sherry? Um, I mean, I, we, uh, I forget the brand that I used when we were, this was an original menu, but I almost always just list out as my go-to. Yeah. Almost always. Um, okay. Just because. So. No, I'm just trying to see drink. if I have all the ingredients, you know? <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. I think I've taken up a lot of the time. Yeah, it's over an hour. So <laughs> if there are any questions, I'm an open book. Feel free to DM me. I mean, I there's a lot of women on this chat already that I admire so much who are like equally, you know, they're equally doing the work. And like there's, this isn't like about like how we're gonna have, you know, equity overnight, nothing is. Um, but I just wanted to show examples of how, how, how much stronger you feel and how much stronger you can be when you are in solidarity with other communities. So. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on and doing this and um thank you for a beautiful me. presentation really beautiful yeah. presentation Mary. yeah so thoughtful and beautiful and thank you so much yeah, this is thank great thank y'all this was a, this was a joy it just yeah, reaffirms just... it reaffirms how much I, I i appreciate you and i you know it's funny i think yeah. that quarantine is one of those things where i've gotten to like talk to you more and you're just awesome so thank you oh thanks dude um, I think, and also like, you know, like I said, I'm not like an expert in any, by any means, but the, but doing this by sharing stories like this, it just leads to more he healing and more solidarity and just more, it makes me feel stronger just to talk with you all, you know, and I hope that you guys can do that too, that you can find some strength when you join up and when you reach out. Yeah, awesome.